morning. I want to give a little uh, report on yesterday. We had a, our last, um, I said I wasn't going to talk about golf anymore. Okay, so we had this event uh, called In His Grip. Uh, it was an In His Grip golf clinic, and we met out at Battle Creek, and I think there was eight or ten of us out there. And my friend Jeff Cornish came, came out, and he... Um, he taught us some golf skills, but mainly we, we got this message that really applies uh, to our life. And Jeff is really, uh, he really likes acronyms. And so uh, this acronym that he gave us yesterday was called IMPACT. And so with each letter of IMPACT, I-M-P-A-C-T, he had a word that went with that. And then throughout the day, he gave us, uh, throughout the, the lesson that he gave us, he would continually Um, refer back to these words that he had used and encouraged us. Um, He gave us uh, lots of scriptures to go with it. So it wasn't just about our our golf game. In fact, we really spent very little on our golf game. We really talked a lot more about life. And um, so this impact, uh, these these, uh, words that go with this this acronym is, so the I is for intention, and so it's, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, where are you going? Um, you have to have, and it can be something big or something small, um, but what's our intention? And so we could apply that to anything in life. Certainly we could talk about our golf game if you had one, but you could say, I'm going to, I want to create a budget for my home that works. So your intention is to create a good budget. And then M was meaning, and it's like, so why would you do that? Well, you know, we'd like to have more money at the end of the month like we all would. And, uh, and I, I, I'm tired of getting to the end of the month and having no money. So it has great meaning for my life. Um, and then you create a process. How are you going to go about that? How are you going to go about this meaningful intention that you have? And then once you have that process in place, then you have to act. You have to do something. And... Uh, And so you'd create this budget, it's important to your life, and then you'd act upon it, and you'd go a couple months, and then you would check, C is for check, and how did you do? Um, How did the budget work? If it worked, then great, you stay on course. But if it didn't, like it does for most of us, um, then you retool it, you tweak it a little bit, you check it, and then the T was for try. So then you try again. And I think that all of us... um, really got a lot out of it. And again, we'll do it again next year, and, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So, um, so in keeping with this theme, and this will mean more probably to the guys who were there yesterday, um, but my intention today is to, that each one of you would be blessed and encouraged, that you would be different when you leave here than when you came in. This is meaningful to me as the Lord has given me a heart to see people do better in their lives. I'm an encourager. It's, it's a gift that God has given me to encourage people. My process has been to rely on the Holy Spirit and to only give him, and for, to, re, to rely on him to give me this idea for today's message and to completely trust him that this will be a good day. I acted upon this leading and I've prayed and I've studied and I put this message together. I've checked everything, probably way more than I should. But I'm pretty sure I can see God in all this. And now, I will try. I just want to say um, this week that how much I've appreciated all your prayers. Uh, anybody who thought about praying for me. It was like, I just had an incredible week. I, I often, I felt like I was um, kind of lifted or carried, carried along, pushed along. It's just a a really unique feeling that I had this week, and I felt that I knew that God was with me, but I also felt like you guys were with me and and that um, you wanted to hear something from the Lord, and uh, so I really appreciate that. What I'm going to share today, I am just so excited to share because it's it's how I live my life. It is, um, it's how... It's how um, my marriage is with my wife. I don't want to get emotional. (laughs) But um, 
Mark Knopfler and Emmylou Harris put out this duet album, and there's this song on there called This Is Us, and this is us. So if you turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, starting in verse 4. So Philippians 4, starting in verse 4, we're going to read, uh, today we're going to be studying verse 4 through 9. And it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Some background information is important Um, concerning this letter. Paul ministered in Philippi during his second missionary journey, spending about three months in the city. Prior to coming to Philippi, Paul had been in Lystra, and that's the city where he was introduced to a young disciple named Timothy. Paul took Timothy with him as he left Lystra and traveled to other cities. In Acts 16, we get the story of Paul receiving a vision in which a man from Macedonia was standing appealing to Paul, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul, seeing God's leading, set sail, and they took port in Neapolis, and then they traveled by foot to Philippi, which was the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. During this first stay in Philippi, Paul brought to faith in Christ people who would form the core of this blossoming congregation in the city. Among them were Lydia, a businesswoman who opened her home to Paul and his co-workers, and the Philippian jailer who was converted under Paul's ministry after an earthquake miraculously broke open the prison. All of that is in Acts 16. Most of us know down that story, well worth reading. As you see, God intervene and, and break, break Paul free from the prison. Of the four prison epistles, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians, Paul likely wrote this letter last, near the end of his Roman imprisonment around 61, 62 AD. Paul did not write Philippians in response to a crisis or any problems, as he did with Galatians and Colossians. Instead, he wrote to express his appreciation and affection for the Philippian believers. More than any other church, the believers in Philippi offered Paul tangible support for his ministry. They sent cash. Paul's affection for these people is clear throughout the letter as he encouraged them to live out their faith and joy and unity. The book of Philippians is full of verses we all know and try to live our lives by. Verses like, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1.6. To live as Christ and to die as gain. Philippians 1.21. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. And in chapter 2, Paul paints us a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ as the humble servant, which is really the central point of the letter. This letter is certainly one of my favorites as it's filled with joy. Paul loved this church at Philippi and he expresses that joy all through the letter. So here's something to remember as we continue on. This letter was written to believers. It's written to his friends. It's written to people who cared about Paul and he cared about, he cared deeply for them. In fact, I'm reminded as Lori was talking it almost seemed like you got a little choked up talking about Fidel, Lori told me 
the story back just before service started about Fidel. I, the last time I was in San Vicente, I got to work with Fidel most of the week and uh, drive around in this truck that uh, has like no dashboard and no gauges and I was supposed to take the truck out to the dump and um, with a couple of the youth group students and uh, get rid of some stuff. And while we were out there, the, of course, the, it runs out of gas. There's no way to know that there's, there's gas in the truck. And, and I just saw Fidel, the way he works, all of his tools, and, and uh, it just made me so happy to think that, that we were able to provide some really cool stuff for him. He'll be, I can just, he'll be thrilled. So we begin in verse 4, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I would say that today when Fidel gets those uh, tools, he will be rejoicing in the Lord. He'll be so happy. Rejoice means to be glad. Rejoice is a, it's a happy sounding word, don't you think? It's fun to say. It's not really a word we use much anymore, is it? When the Lord does something cool in my life or in the life of someone I know or love, I just say, like I just did, that makes me so happy. Or the Lord is so awesome. And in saying that, I'm glad in the Lord. I don't think I've ever even used that word, rejoice. We used to sing worship songs, I remember, a long time. I've been a Christian a long time, over 30 years. And I remember when, we first, when I first got saved that we would always sing this song that was rejoice, rejoice. And I won't even begin to say a tune because it'll end up on the comment cards and I don't want to have that. But... <laughs> but um, but um, and then we would, they would break it up into a round, and sometimes you get like a three-part round going with this rejoice, and again, I say rejoice, and it was super cool, you know? It's probably dated now. It's probably not hip or uh, cool, but it was a great song. But it's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be glad in the Lord. So I ask you today, are you glad today? If you took an inventory within your heart and your brain Are you glad? Are you glad in the Lord? If your answer is no, then what's stopping you from rejoicing in him? What if we set up a polling booth out in the parking lot this morning? What if we had and and, uh, each of us went in and we were asked to answer one question totally anonymously and the question would be, "Are, are you glad? Are you rejoicing in the Lord? The collected data from all our answers would paint a clear picture of our attitude towards the Lord. Some of us would say yes. We are rejoicing in the Lord. And I'm sure that some of us would say no. Rejoice, be glad. Are you kidding me? Bill, you have no idea what's going on in my life right now. Everything's a mess. I've got problems at work. I've got problems at home. My finances are in the pit. I went to the doctor this week and I need surgery. My extended family is at odds with one another and no one is communicating. My best friend just told me that she's getting a divorce. The neighbor's dog barks all night and I never get any sleep. My car broke down on the freeway last week and I can't afford the repairs. Rejoice. I don't think so. Look at the world around us right now. With the lightning speed of modern technology, instantly we can read and in many cases watch the news of wars, terrorist terrorist attacks, new outbreaks of diseases and natural disasters all over the globe. At home, our country seems as divided as ever, and at times it appears that our religious freedoms are in jeopardy. Life can be difficult. Circumstances come our way that we would never choose. But they do come. And what are we supposed to do? Paul says, to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How do we do that? Verses four through nine. Five verses containing seven sentences. Five of these sentences encourage us to do something. They are action verses. One of these sentences gives us a result or a prize. In other words, do these things and you'll get this result. 
in one, in one sentence is a statement of fact. Five verses, seven sentences that can change your outlook on your life. Some of you know that I'm a baker by trade. I've worked in the baking industry for over 35 years, but rarely do I ever bake at home. I love to cook, and I'm pretty good at it, at least people say that, and I I really enjoy cooking. I love to throw stuff together and kind of look in the fridge and the cupboards and kind of throw, and I can usually put something together that's good. I can follow a recipe, but most of the time I do that from memory, and it's fun. Baking is totally different. If you've ever been baking at home and ran out of one ingredient and tried to substitute something else, well, you know, that just doesn't really work. How many times have you made cookies and they didn't spread at all? You just ended up with little balls of dough on the pan. Or, or just the opposite, maybe they spread all over the pan and they ended up flat and crispy. That's because you made a mistake. You either have had a bad recipe to begin with, um, or you just made a mistake. Baking has very little room for error. Baking is a science. There are all kinds of chemical reactions going on in baking. Make one mistake, measure something improperly, properly, leave something out, add something that shouldn't be there, and your French bread or your angel food cake will not turn out as planned. As I look at verses four through nine, I see a recipe, a recipe on how to live a life where we can rejoice and have peace. We just need to follow the recipe that Paul lays out for us. He says to rejoice in the Lord. He uses this word eight times in this letter to Philippians. Let's quickly look at at these verses. So let's turn over to chapter one. Philippians one. We'll start in verse 12. And Paul says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances has turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim it proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. So Paul rejoiced that Christ was proclaimed. He was glad that the gospel was getting out. He was rejoicing, and let's remember, he's in prison His circumstances were not good. He had lost most of his freedoms, yet he rejoiced, and the gospel was being proclaimed. We'll go to chapter 2, verse 17. But he says, But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. And I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul rejoiced that he was being used by God to get the gospel out. He used his circumstances for the cause of Christ. He didn't spend time concentrating on where he was at or what was happening to him. He looked to God and said, okay, here I am, show me what to do. He was being used. When crummy stuff comes your way, do you look to the Lord and say, okay, here I am. What do you want me to do? How can I serve you in this circumstance? Or do you say something else? Trusting in the Lord in our worst circumstances builds our faith and it changes us. This is really an important point here. Despite his circumstances, Paul found great purpose in his life. 
looking back to chapter 1, verse 21, we, we, I said this uh, verse in the opening um, remarks. It says, in 121 says, For me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. When things aren't going our way, do we ask the Lord to help us to find purpose? We should. In chapter 2, starting in verse 25, it says, But I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed, because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him the more eager, sent him the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and, may be less con- and, he- and I may be less concerned about you. Now we all get this. We're deeply gl- happy and glad when thankful when God heals people that we know and love. Paul rejoiced that God had spared the life of his friend. And he also knew that everyone was worried back in Philippi about Epaphroditus. They were worried, they were anxious about Paul, his imprisonment, what was going to happen to him. And they were, then they were worried about Epaphroditus because they'd heard that he was sick to the point of death. So Paul wanted to send him back with a message saying that everything was okay. In fact, he sent this letter with Epaphroditus. All all the times that God has healed my wife, I've rejoiced, you guys have rejoiced. We've all rejoiced. And then in chapter three, we read in verse one of Philippians, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, It is a safeguard for you. It's a safeguard. In the Greek, this word safeguard is translated certain or true. You can count on it. The act of encouraging one another to rejoice, to find the place of purpose in our trials, to look to God and say, yes, I'll serve you in this place. I'll serve you right now where I am. That's a good thing. We should do it for one another not to ever diminish the situations that we're in, or never, and I'm not talking about you're, you're happy and you're rejoicing because calamity has just fallen upon you. That's not, I'm never saying that. We're human, that, life is hard. Stuff comes our way that we would, we'd never choose, we, we don't expect it, it just happens. But when you're in the midst of it, and you can't get out of it, it just seems like that's going to be where you're at right now, Be like Paul, who was in prison, and he found purpose in his life. And then the final two times are right here in verse 4 of chapter 4. So the question this morning is, why aren't we rejoicing more? So let's move on to to, uh, verse 6, and it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. Anxious. Literally, it means to be troubled with cares. Your mind is filled up with stuff that you're worrying about. Why do we worry? We all worry, don't we? Sometimes our worries get so bad they consume us. Worry can take us captive, and we stop rejoicing. Worry can actually lead to medical problems. You can get ulcers over so much worry. I grew up in a house of worry. I have great parents, but they could worry about everything and anything. They're very conservative, never take a risk, and they passed that along to me. Now, I was much more adventurous, but I was a worrier. 
One of the cool things that the Lord did for me when I surrendered to him over 30 years ago was that most of that worry in general, it just went away. And between Liz and I, easily I would be the one most prone to worry about something. Liz never worries about anything. But thankfully, I don't worry too much. And we've had plenty of stuff to worry about over the past years. It seems that worry, it seems that people worry about, uh, worry about like in three specific areas. They worry about their past, maybe something that happened to them or something that they did. So maybe something they just can't let go. They worry about the present, what's going on right now, and if things aren't resolved quickly, then these situations will turn into worries about the future. How is this all going to turn out? What's going to happen? What if that happens? What am I supposed to do? You know what I'm talking about, right? Does this sound familiar? And thinking about the future, we come up with all kinds of scenarios, and pretty soon we are making contingency plans in our minds for every crazy scenario that, come, that might come our way. And I, I would say that we've all done that. We think, oh my gosh, if that happens, then I'll do this. And if that happens, then we just, our minds are just filled with worry at times. Let's see what Jesus had to say about worry. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, Jesus says, and these are red letters, he really said this, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, They do not sow, nor nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, or nor do they spin. Yet I say that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these." But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So, don't, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And again, in context for the scriptures that we read in, where we're at in Philippians, Paul knew that his friends in Philippi were worried about him and his circumstances. This letter, this, was, this part of the letter was to help them not to worry. He's saying, God is doing a good work. I'm okay I'm in his hands. Be anxious for nothing. So what are we supposed to do? Verse 6 says that we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to talk to God. Tell him your needs. Tell him your worries. As believers, we're called to be thankful. He's the perfect person to talk to about everything. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, or actually in starting in 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. This word uh, anxiety goes with anxious real close to the similar word, but interesting, the, the root of this word, anxiety, means to divide, separate into part, Parts cut into pieces or to be split into factions. Have you ever felt like your mind was just a mess with worry? That you couldn't keep your thoughts straight? That your mind was just a muddled mess? And you weren't good to anyone in this state. Our minds get divided into all these things that we have no control over and we have no answers for. 
Again, let me be clear. Everyone worries. If you care, you worry. We want to help. We want to know what we can do. We would like to control the situation. And when we can't, we worry. So I don't want you to think, oh, I'm a worrier. I'm bad. Oh, I'm, God can't use me. Bill thinks I'm a subpar Christian. Nothing would be farther than the tr- from the truth. We're human. We're not perfect. But sometimes we take worry too far and it robs us of our peace with God. Worry muddles up our brains in many ways and is a big waste of our time and energy. The result of those prayers to God are in verse 7 of Philippians. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the kind of peace that only God can bring into our lives. It totally encompasses our being. It surpasses all comprehension. It guards our minds in Christ Jesus. This word guard, it's a military term. And literally, it's like having a garrison of armed soldiers around your mind that won't let anything pass. That's what God's peace will do for us. It'll guard our minds and our hearts. Peace. Don't we all want peace? I want peace. Peace is defined as rest and completeness, soundness, safety, tranquility, contentment. There's a peace that comes into your life at the moment of salvation. Up until that moment, we had no peace. Every one of us here that, and I think I noticed by everybody, I think you know, we're all believers, and there was that moment when you, when you saw that you needed him, that your, that your life was a mess. We spent our entire life building up a storehouse of wrath based on our sin. Jesus dealt with that sin on the cross, but until we accepted that sacrifice into our lives, until we saw that it was true, what it truly was, our redemption, we just had no peace. We were at odds with God. But then we surrendered. We bent our knee, we raised the the white flag, we bowed our head and we asked him to save us. And at that moment, the blood of Christ covered all our sin, all our wrongdoing. He made us clean, as white as snow, and we had peace, peace with God. But then we had the rest of our lives to live the daily struggle of life and all that brings our way. Life is complicated. It's anything but easy. So I ask you this question. If you know him, are you at peace? Do you have peace? You might say, Bill, I've prayed. I've asked God to give me peace and he hasn't. I don't know what to do. I think the secret ingredient in this recipe is found in the second sentence of verse five. I told you that one of these sentences was a statement of fact, and it is. It's the key key to all these things said in these verses. It's the key to finding peace. In verse five, the second part, it says the Lord is near. The Lord sees all the trouble in this world. He sees it all. He sees everything going on in your life right now. At this very moment, he knows exactly what you're thinking about. He knows the trial that you're going through right now that you haven't told anybody about. He knows everything you and I are worried about. He knows. He's near. He's in the midst of your trial. The Lord is close by. Too often we think that the Lord is far off and not listening to our prayers and not ready to help. We ask, why isn't he fixing things? Your situation right now might seem desperate, and maybe it is. Your circumstances might seem like a lost cause with no good resolution in sight. But God doesn't see things that way. His ways are not our ways. We may think differently, but God never wastes our time. We might go through something and think this is a complete waste of time. You know that God never thinks that. 
He always has something going on. He always has a purpose. We just need to look to him and get on board with him. Let's turn over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse that you guys will all know. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. It's hard to find peace when you don't think the Lord is close by, but he's near. The trouble is with us. We need to stay close to the Lord. We need to stay in communication with him. He's the one to talk to about our issues and our circumstances. He's the one that can bring us peace. We don't need to ask for peace because he's the prince of peace. We just need to enter into his peace. Be like if Jesus was back there in the library right now. He's the Prince of Peace. He was back there. And all we had to do to have peace was just to walk through that door. And we'd have peace. That's all we need to do. But you know what we do? We stay in here and we say, Oh Lord, bring that room to us. Would you, would you come here? Would you bring the peace? And he's saying, I'm right here. Just enter in. Enter into his peace. Having peace or not having peace is a choice we make. Just enter in. He's near. In fact, he's right here. If I gave you all a chance to guess the location for me where I would be the most at peace, would your guess be, oh, easy, on a golf course? (laughs) Actually, most of the time, I'm not at peace on the golf course. (laughs) And all the golfers that have came out on Mulligan Mondays and saw me play, they would know why I answered that way. I'm at peace when I'm at the hospital. So weird, this work that God has done in me and my wife. I love Providence Hospital. It's so hard to describe, but we have spent so much time there over the past few years. I'm just at peace. I have no worries. I know that when we get into these situations where Liz's health is at risk, that I have no control over the outcome. In truth, I've never been mad at God over these things. Not that God couldn't handle my anger. He could handle your anger if you're mad. Because I've just learned to accept that this is just part of our story. I see these hospital visits and all the turmoil in Liz's health is just part of our testimony. It's part of my testimony. It's part of our testimony. It's part of our family's testimony. As things start heating up and her health starts going south, I've learned to say thank you. Not thank you that it's happening. That'd just be nutty. But I say thank you that you are here with us and that you see all this. Please help us. Please make her better. I'd like to take her home but that is your call. You know what I want. Just, just show me how to serve you here. The opportunities to show his love and comfort with others happens all over the place when we're there. Whether it's with the doctors, the nurses, the people who clean the room, strangers that I meet in the elevator, and as he wills, the witness we are to our children, our grandchildren, and to our friends. It's him working through us. I give him all the credit. 
But there's a part that we play. We've chosen to say yes to the Lord in all of our circumstances. God wants to use all of us right here where we're at. And if we let him, he will change us. We've been in at least three situations in the last 12 years that unless the Lord intervened and turned the tide, that I was going to leave the hospital alone. Add to that all the numerous paramedic visits to the house, the seizures, the long hospital stays. I just know that I'm not in control. So I never have a second thought of when Liz goes to the hospital. It helps that I live with someone who has such a great perspective on life. Before she went into open heart surgery, I can do this. One of the last things she said to me was, I'm in a win-win situation. If I make it through the surgery, my heart will be fixed and hopefully I'll have many years of life ahead of me. But if the Lord takes me, if it's my time, then I get to be with him. She said that with a straight face, full of conviction, and then she giggled. See, we've, we live our lives in such a way because we know the Lord is near. Put that truth in your brain and it will change your life, I promise. Verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Paul lived his life in such a way that he was an example to others. You know, Paul had a past. He persecuted the church. He held the robes while Stephen was stoned. But Paul knew he was forgiven, and he moved on. He said yes to the Lord. He didn't worry about his past. He got busy for the Lord and was so confident in his walk with Jesus that he could say, be like me. Do what I do. So when he says the things you have learned and received, what things is he talking about? He's saying to rejoice, to be anxious for nothing, to pray, and to say yes to God in the midst of your circumstances. Verse 5, we don't want to leave this out. Paul says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. So here's some application. This word gentle means to be mild or moderate. When I look at this verse and think of the people in my life that are gentle in spirit, it brings to mind all the people that are my closest friends and family. They exhibit gentleness and a steadiness to their lives that is so attractive. No big swings of change and upheaval in their lives. No huge range of emotions. They can be counted on in a crisis because their heads are clear and they're free from worry and angst. They give their trouble and their circumstances to the Lord and they know that he's in charge. They know that he is near. They have learned to get in step with the Lord They have learned to say yes to him in their circumstances. I go to these people for counsel and advice. I go to these people for prayers. When Liz is in trouble health-wise, they're the first people I notify. They're my go-to people. My guess is that you gravitate to people like this. Steady, moderate, gentle people. People you can count on. That's the kind of people we should all strive to be. My encouragement today for you is the same as Paul's. Walk through this life in such a way so that you can be an example to others. Free your mind of worry. Give everything to God and trust him with all your circumstances. Say yes to God. Follow this recipe and you and I will be able and ready to rejoice in the Lord. Can I have the band come up?
you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you don't have the peace in your life because the weight of sin and guilt is so heavy, Jesus said, come to me, all of you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you want that rest, then ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to take control of your life. Allow him to sit on the throne of your heart and give him all your circumstances. He is ready and willing to save you today. He's able to give you eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you're here with us. And I do pray, Lord, for all of the unspoken needs that fill up this room, Lord. All the trouble that's come to people's lives and you know all about this stuff, Lord. Some of it's stuff that we cause on our own. And we're just trying to get, it, get out. And some of it's came from out of nowhere and we don't understand it. Lord, would you remind us that you're here with us, you're near. You want to listen to your kids talk to you. Pray that we, you'd help us to give everything to you, Lord. Give every desire of our heart to you, Lord. We give every piece of worry and angst to you, Lord. And that, Lord, that you would instill in us that we really have no control. You have the control, Lord, over so many of these things. May you help us today, Lord. May, we want to have your peace. May you bring it to us, Lord, today. Help us to enter in. In Jesus' name, amen.